Hey, it is uh, awesome to be here and talking to you. Uh, one correction for the record, I'm not in command of anything yet. We are standing up the War Fighting Development Centers. I'll talk to you about that more in the future. But uh, it is super exciting stuff. And it's been, been an effort that has been going on for years that Admiral Roden and other folks have indicated to. And I think you're going to be excited about what we have to talk about. So before I go on, Admiral Roden, uh, distinguished guest, great to have you here. Um, thank you for listening. One specific individual I want to highlight, Ricky Ellison, where are you? Can you raise your hand? Ricky Ellison, uh, I can't see you, but I know you're here. Where is it? Okay, there. Awesome. Thank you, sir. Um, Ricky runs an organization, the Missile Defense Advocacy Alliance, where he uh, does a number of things, but one thing he does every year uh, here in D.C., right before SNA, is acknowledged the Missile Defender of the Year for each uh, service, the Air Force, the Army, the Navy, and the National Guard. And I had the pleasure with Admiral Roden of attending that ceremony, sir. It's quite moving, wonderful for you to do it. FC2 Ringer from the Donald Cook was a recipient this year. Wonderful to see this young 22-year-old come to this organization and get acknowledged by so many significant people. So thanks again, sir. Um, Great, great group. Uh, Mary Jackson, I don't think, is here, but she, are you Mary? Admiral Mary Jackson held a mentoring session uh, this afternoon. And talk about a vibrant, enthusiastic group of officers. I, I haven't seen anything like it. I, I went up to Admiral Hart immediately afterwards and said, that is an awesome group. So this was a discussion from 07 down to junior officer about mentoring, leadership, all that stuff. It was phenomenal. Um, this morning, I woke up at 4.30 in the morning in terror for this speech and thought about my own mentors, some of my own mentors. So, uh, Captain Craig Langman, can you raise your hand? He's my CEO on Sanjak. So, in the world of advice, I remember meeting you on deployment, first time, Hilo hangar, you know, he's going to go fly off on the carrier, leave me there, I'm terrified. And I went to him for, you know, specific instructions, tell me what I need to do, and he just looked at me and said, don't mess it up, only he didn't say mess. <laughs> and he flew away, and I went up to the bridge and stood there in stark terror in my chair until he came back. And that was his frequent, it was a frequent occurrence between us. He went to the carrier often, and he just said, don't mess it up. So I hope I don't mess it up, sir, and thanks for that sage advice. It's followed me till this morning at 4.30. Um, a couple of comments. Uh, I, I want to acknowledge a group of folks that I've been uh, beneficial, beneficiary of, thanks to Admiral Roden and at PERS 41. So I'd like to ask my staff to stand up and introduce you to him. Will you stand up, please? So quick bios, Captain Frank Olmo, CEO Mahan, CEO of Anzio, Chief of Staff of NAMC, former Chief of Staff of Surf 4, now my deputy. Wonderful br breadth of experience that he brings to us. Uh, Captain Darren McPherson, CEO of Sterrett and uh, former CEO of Sterrett and PERS 410 brings a very critical skill set to us. Captain Joe Cahill, former CEO of Preble and Destroyer's Branch Head on the APNAV staff, he's my tactics guy. Um, Captain Joel Stewart, former CEO of Anchorage, exceptional fly fisherman, author of a book, and was his ship was the last slide of Major General Walsh's pitch. So he brings an amphibious flavor to us. Commander Hank Kim, CEO of the Fort Worth, is my N8, N9. So all these folks have have worked together with me for the last five months to put some granularity to the ideas you've heard about. Uh, where's Mike Dwan? You're not standing up. He's my, uh, my WTI, my warfare tactics instructor. And then my alter ego, uh, Reba Contivax, my aide, and she does much more than, than to help me get where I'm going on time. And Lieutenant Naomi Slusser, my deputy EA. So awesome to have you here. Thank you. Um, another group. Thank you. Another group, Captain Brian O'Donnell, uh, Mr. Tony Talbert, and Mr. Chip Swicker. They're, they're part of the Navy Air and Missile Defense Command. And their efforts, uh, and Captain Olmo's efforts when he was at NAMSI, have created a program I'm going to am most enthusiastic about, and I'm going to brief you on today. Now, Warfare Tactics Instructor, stand up. Stand up, where are you? Okay. Lieutenant Commander C. Harris. And then Lieutenant Dan O'Neill, Lieutenant Commander Mike Dwan, and Lieutenant Adam Galaska. Sorry, I've been working on that all day. Great to see you. These 
are our hope in the future, and I'm going to talk about you extensively throughout the breach. So find them. I made them stand up so you can see who, who they are, and you can go seek and talk to them about their experience. Thanks. Have a seat. All right, awesome. Let's get on to the meat of it. Next, next slide, please. So a uh, lot of guidance. Uh, hold on. Not this slide. Next slide. Okay, we'll go back to that. Uh, I boiled down the guidance from Fleet Forces and, and uh, the CNO's statement of work to us, and I tried to put it as succinctly as possible. Increase war fighting effectiveness on our ships on an, on an individual level, a unit level, and a warfare commander level. That's what we're all about. Admiral Roden put up one side war fighting first. This is it. What do I spend my time doing? Well, putting some meat on the bones of these ideas, but I spend half of my time doing missionary work which means I go to ship, and I give them the same brief I'm giving to you without slides, on a wardroom, man-to-man basis. It is awesome. And our sailors are excited, and they're ready for this, and they want to do it. The next part of my work outside outreach is listening and taking input from a lot of organizations. So it hasn't just been us stovepiped away in, DC, in uh, San Diego thinking about this. It's been collecting data, synthesizing it, putting it together, into the brief you're going to talk to today. So slide, I'm going to, I'm going to drive you through a knot hole here, but I'm going to bring you back to that. Uh, next slide. Okay, I call these focus areas because lines of operation is confusing to me. This is what I'm thinking about, and this is what I'm going to talk to you about. Little history lesson. Weapons, tactics, and structures are something that our air community uses. In 1968, they produced the Alt Report. And that drove them to create the Top Gun uh, model that we saw in the Top Gun, Top, Tom Cruise movie in 1986. It's investing in their youth. That's what that is about. In 1983, the Becca, strikes, Becca Valley strikes failed, and they created Strike University. And in the mid-'90s, they merged Top Dome, Strike University, and Top Gun into NSOC. So there's a huge history here, a 40-year history of creating this and getting this right. And it is an awesome model for us to look at and take and adapt and apply appropriately to us. Now, what is my personal experience with weapons, tactics, and structures? About two years ago, I was in a war game. And I've been in a series of war games in a highly classified environment with a bunch of smart, smart operators, generally top gun, top dome grads. And we've uh, fought a war game at a very high level. And it's in, a, in an environment where you actually execute operating it's not the computer running this engagement. You operate. They synthesize it all together, and we follow the plan, brief, execute, debrief model, PBED, something we can learn a lot from. And when they go up and brief, the aviators I'm talking about, it is a no-holds-barred. They call it like it is, and if you don't call your mistake, someone's going to call you out. So they're honest about it, and they work through that process, and I was on my knees at the end of it. I said, holy cow, look at this. And I'm listening to lieutenants, specifically Lieutenant Turtle Rice was my fighter weapons tactics instructor, and uh, TJ Stowe was my E2D weapons tactics instructor. So we're given this problem, we come together, we formulate our battle plan, and we start fighting it two runs a day through this P-bed model I talked to you about. And by Wednesday, I was on my knees under my desk ready to suck my thumb because we were getting crushed because we were fighting like... I, I thought was a good way to fight in a disaggregated or a deconflicted manner. And this process made us integrate and innovate and understand what each other were doing. It was an awesome experience, and I'm a believer in it. So that's my real-time experience. And I've been back there about six or seven times, many events, and it's, uh, it's this powerful place and a model that we need to start going to. Uh, foreign to SWOs. Foreign to SWOs but we need to start getting in that business and understanding how to fight together. Okay, doctrine and TTP I'm going to talk about. It's the foundational way we do it. Other communities follow doctrine. I'm going to not put anyone on report but myself. I used doctrine when I needed to in my career historically. I needed to do something. I found a piece of doctrine that suited it. I cited it as a reference, and we went and did it. That didn't mean I understood doctrine. It means I used it to my advantage. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit about that. Advanced readiness phase program. We're going to explain what this means, but in essence, it's taking ships to sea, we call it Deseron Group Sail, and doing some very complicated maneuvering at the end of the basic phase so we're better ready to go to Comp 2X, and I'll show you that. 
And the final thing is the surface warfare uh, combat tactical training continuum. It's a system, very innocuous bullet, very complicated thing. I spent three hours with Tony Tauber today talking about that, and I'm going to explain to you what that is. So let's go back to the second slide. So this is uh, uh, IMD WTI class number four, graduated in early October. And I had the ability in my schedule to go down and meet them when they classed up, and I met them in the middle, and I met them at the end. And there was a visible, tangible transformation among these students as they went through that process. So let's talk about a few of them. The two fullbacks in the middle, C. Harris I introduced, and, and Justin Kelch to his left, study partners and weightlifting partners. Uh, Justin Kelch this week is in Nellis Air Force Base doing F-22 Aegis Integration Doctrine Development now. He graduated in October. Let's go one tier up on either side. Uh, Lieutenant Chris Murphy and Lieutenant Christina Duro. I was on USS Anzio last week on a Thursday watching those officers, so they're in their first DIVO tour, run advanced warfare training phase two at a level I've never seen. They were training, and they were credible, and they were confident, and they were competent. That's what this program does. Awesome. I mean, I left, and Brian Sorson's the captain of that ship, and I was on cloud nine. He goes, wait, 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 wait a second, Admiral, there's this, that, and the other thing. I go, yeah, you live in your world. I'm going to live in my world. That was awesome. And Chris Murphy's going to uh, Fallon at the end of the month. He's going to do E2D, Aegis Tactical Development. So it's tactics and training. That's what we're about here, tactics and training. And the guy in the back, Lieutenant Commander Mike Dwan, in the last war game I went to, so I'm, I'm in Top Gun City. I mean, everyone's got a call sign, right? Not me, but everyone else has one. And there's probably 22 sets of these in the room and about 100 brown shoes. And Mike Dwan was the senior briefer for that group. He led the briefing for all those warfare, all those runs, and, and in that war game setting. And he was respected and acknowledged by the entire group. That's the power of investing in our youth. Okay, let's go. Next slide. So here's Matt Cox. Matt Cox is the senior instructor at the Navy Air and Missile Defense Command. He and Mark Davis before him put this course together, grew it from seven weeks to 19 weeks. Look at all those uniforms in the room. This is joint week. So that's the ADAFCOs from the AAMDC from Colorado Springs as well as Air Force guys and Marine Corps guys teaching joint stuff at a very high level. This is not a gentleman's or gentlewoman's course. It's 19 weeks where you work weekends and you work nights to get it right. And that's the transformation that occurs to them because they worked hard and they accomplished something and felt proud of it when they were done. And that's why they're confident and competent when they get in front of a crowd, regardless who it is. And that's what we want to do. We want to create that confidence and confidence and invest in our youth at a very young level. Next slide. Matt Cox is coming to work for me. He's going to help me baseline this program across all tactical disciplines. So he's somewhere between Dahlgren and San Diego with his minivan and his family. But when he gets out there, he's going to get his rucksack ready, and I'm going to load it up for him. Okay, so this is the program, Warfare Tactics and Instructors. That's the SWO timeline from DIVO to Major Command. We're going to target those officers after their second DIVO tour to compete for billets in their first shore tour to go to a school that I just described and then do what I call a production tour. So you don't become an expert because you go to school. You become an expert when you do something, when you teach, when you develop tactics. So those commands in the blue on the right, that's where these officers are going to go. We're going to spread them out. And I'm going to track them. And they're going to have a connection back to the mothership. So I know what they're teaching, and they're enforcing a standard across our Navy. The way, the air, the way the, our air, aviation community does this is they do this thing called reblueing. You heard Admiral Moran talk about it. They bring them back every year. Come on back home. And they bring them in, and they keep them current and ready to execute. And we're going to do that with our warfare tactics instructors, too. There's a nuance there. Weapons tactics instructor for the aviators, warfare tactics instructors for us, because that's the way we fight. So there's some flavors of, of uh, WTIs there. Uh, on the bottom chart in the yellow, or the red, 
So the first is IMD. That's the most mature. I've talked at length about that. Uh, Admiral Roden talked about uh, NMOC's version of a ASW WTI, which exists today. I have not talked to a single captain or commodore who's not in love with this program. They're doing ASW at a level they haven't done before. And they step on and they're ready to go. They're ready to execute. So it's a nine-week program. It's an addition. And we're going to keep that program. What I'd like to do is build it in the future that, so it includes surface warfare and it falls in line with our model here. So all our WTIs happen after their second Divo tour for their first shore tour. And, and we can track it and track those officers at all those commands. The, the third one is the amphibious warfare WTI. I talked to a couple of major command amphibious officers in the Pentagon, post-major command amphibious officers. I didn't talk to you, Cedric, I'm sorry. And I talked to them on a Friday afternoon, long day at the Pentagon, everyone's tired. And I said, hey, what do, you, what do you think about this amphibious WTI idea? And I explained it to them. And they looked at me like I had lobsters coming out of my ears. You're nuts. And then Monday morning, dunk, 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 emails come in, hey, we want to talk. So they had a chance to sleep and think about it. And it's investing in that very critical warfare area that you heard Admiral Roden talk about and you heard General Walsh talk about. So this is probably the most complicated discipline because it's you know, within the lifelines, amphibious ops, and that, that, that execution of that very complicated dance. It's the planning with the Marines. It's a very significant combat system on America. And it's the unknowns that we have to plan for and assemble for to execute. So we're working on setting up that curriculum now and working through all the stakeholders to make sure we have the right pieces and parts for that. These guys are all going to go to a common core, guys and gals, go to a common core for five weeks where we teach them how to instruct, attack a tactical problem, make sure they do it consistently, understand the reference material, and then they're going to go off and understand that discipline. So these officers are then going to go to be a department head on, on a ship. So one per ship is the goal and one per staff to raise that tactical execution on that ship when they execute as a department head. So we're talking about a five and a half year piece where they're working in this field uh, on, a very, on a very discreet level. And then they can keep working on it. I mean, I think how much better a resource sponsor I would have been for Admiral Roden if I had been an IMD WTI in my last job. I would have been a much more effective uh, helper with our acquisition community to make sure we get it right. So this is powerful, and it is a significant thing for tactical development and training for us. I, want to, I can't talk enough about this, investing in our youth. Next slide. All right, this is uh, something we typically run away from, doctrine, because we're afraid of it. But uh, we need to grasp it and understand it, and Captain Cahill and the staff and I have kind of worked a long time to put this together in a logical, coherent fashion that makes sense to us and and depicts the way we should operate. So the MCOs and the O plans go together to form the contextual, contextual background of what we're going to do. The roles of our ships, whether they're independent deployers or HVU escorts or CSGs, strike group deployers or amphibious ships, that plays into how they're going to be used. The threats, new threats, you heard Admiral Davidson talk about them. Got to build that in the calculus to keep us current. And then the missions of our ships. So those are all the things on on the uh, right-hand side of the slide for my focus areas, okay? So that's all how do we fight our ship and how do I resource that doctrine to employ. Over on the, on the far right are three concentric circles. Legacy doctrine, which is what exists today. Emerging threats, which we talked about for Admiral Davidson's piece. And then fleet introduction, which is a program like NIFCA. Rolling that all up and doing the grunt work to take those two last circles and build that back into our mainline doctrine so we can refer to it as an area we need to invest in and focus on. Let's look at the bottom right hand part of the chart. That's what guys and, guys and gals in Fallon do. They don't just come up with a good idea, sit around a table, think about it, okay, let's look at it from 360 degrees, yeah, that looks about right, let's plan it. When uh, Admiral Harvey got a hold of the NIFCA CONOPS, he said, we're going to war game this. And that's what my first, my first experience that I talked about earlier was. It was actually wargaming and saying, does it work? So I'm talking about model it, simulate it, assess it, exercise it, measure it, publish it, understand where it's published in a hierarchy that makes sense to people, train to it, get Captain Welch to teach him that at SWAS, set up a hierarchy where they get it 
and it's consistent through all our mission areas, that's that work that has to happen there. So I want to drive them to an Inswitic website where they can pull up that mission area. Boom, I know what's current. And then there's going to be a portal on that that only WTIs can get into because I'm going to call on them to help comment on new emerging doctrine to make sure we get it right. And we're working on that piece, and, and that's Captain Stewart's lane solid. And the, the cycle at the end is the, re, the repeat of this thing. So when I first got into this, I was thinking, man, advanced tactics, awesome. Well, it's like your house. If your house has a bad foundation, you shouldn't build an addition on it and hope it'll last. you got to fix the foundation and then build the addition, and it becomes a system and an investment that's enduring. Next slide. ARP, advanced readiness phase. This is a notional thing that we do. Three weeks, robust. SOE driven, Desron commander executing, not vent by vent by vent like we do in the basic phase, but a complicated task force augmented by my staff who is teaching. Assessment's important, got to do that, but got to teach. The teach is the big deal here. So taking WTIs and teaching, as I described Christine Duro and Chris Murphy on that ship, teaching, okay, let's see what you did, let's look at the tactic, what if you had done this? Let's do it again. Repeat, repeat, repeat. Reps and sets to get it right. That's what we're talking about here. So the ARP is very important to us because I've been charged with looking at our training continuum and filling the gaps. And when I go to strike group four and strike group 15, this is something we need to do. We're doing it kind of now, but we're not doing it consistently and we're not doing it with standards and I want to apply that to our force so we can get more out of Comp 2X more out of that advanced training before we deploy. Okay, next slide. So this is a, you know, I was in a brief with a CNO once, and uh, I was the briefer, and I put up a slide, and he's like, hmm, hold on, Captain, that's, that's an innocent slide. And we camped out, and he drilled down there, and, uh, you know, I was dancing on the head of a pin. So this is an innocent slide, but it's extremely complicated. So think of it as a system. So one of the things I've been charged with is tactical development from the division officer level to the major commander level. So that's in here. Let's talk about the continuum of, shi of a ship from the maintenance phase to deployment. So that's in here. You can see where the ARP falls in the middle. That's that bridging mechanism to get to the integrated phase. Let's talk about warfare commander training. We've done this pretty, pretty well in the past, but I think it's a new time. And the threats that we talked about and the rebalance to the Pacific should drive us, me, to train our warfare commanders with a standard. So one of those things we're going to do, as an example, is build Aegis Combat Simulators in Fallon, Nevada. And we're going to take warfare commanders to Fallon to integrate and train with the E2D squadron and fighters. And that's going to be their capstone graduation exercise before they move on and go to sea. And they're going to do it again and again and again until they're really good at it. And my staff is going to work with Satan Khan staff. Admiral Khan is the head of NSOC. And we're going to execute that training together to make sure all those folks integrate together. And we're going to do it with Desron commanders too. So the aviators use this thing called the training and readiness matrix, TNR matrix. And I've spent a lot of time thinking about that and talking about it. And we're going to develop our own TNR matrix so we understand what things have to happen to get the product we want to deploy as proficient and combat ready as we can. So that's in the background here. Think of it as a system, a lot of moving parts, connecting SWAS with CSCS debt, with ATG, with A schools, and understanding who's got what and making sure we haven't run away from the problem and assume that you've got it and you've got it and nobody's got it. So let's, let's do that connective tissue to make sure that's linked up and executable. That's what this is about. Long-term project and it's never done. It's kind of like the ops officer schedule. It's only good till you finish it and then the next input comes in, it's bad. You gotta go back and adjust and adjust and adjust and adjust to make sure you're making this as tight as possible. And that's what Admiral Roden's charged me to do. So we're looking at that and getting our forces together to kind of grapple with that very gritty, gritty problem. But that's a key to this, is making sure we have a system and we know all those pieces who now work for separate organizations, I want to influence all of them. And I've had great conversations with Dave Welch and 
and Bill McKinley, and we're on the road to make this happen. There's a human piece of this, too, for Witties that I talked to Captain Black about, about advocacy for me, right? Where are they going and what are they doing and watching to make sure that we're taking care of them and they're coming back and doing what we've invested in them to do. Okay, next slide. So here it is all together. You know, this is a, this is a big time, long evolution and slows are impatient by nature. So set that aside. Commit to this action, stay the course, and we are going to become tactically excellent beyond our wildest dreams. Four elements, I talked about them all. Warfare, combat, uh, warfare tactics instructors at strength, where we want them, doing what we want them to do. Doctrine, relevant, validated, and taught. That's an important piece, and taught. Advanced readiness phase, works in ORFRP, put out a standard. You know, uh, one thing I really didn't camp on, I should have, is there's a high end and low end to this, probably. And the high end's out of PMRF, where they got Aegis Ashore and a world-class range. Emma Williams is out there, Desron 31, Commodore Bruchnell. We're talking about how to make that high end piece robust and good. I still got to take care of the ships in the Bay Capes and Mayport and San Diego and everywhere else and make sure their ARP gets them what they need as well. And then the SWIC tick is the, the system the connection of all those units and me being held accountable for this by Admiral Roden to make sure we're all in alignment. It is, it is an awesome job. I think I got the best job, and we're going to make a difference. That's my brief. Standing by for your questions. Admiral, thanks for your time today. Commander Michael Cummins, PEOC4I. Um, I'm a TAC Trade Group PAC alumni. Awesome. And I was wondering where the fleet synthetic training was going to fall into your realm. Is it going to be a part of it, parallel to it, well, conjunction so with, or? Details to be worked out. Synthetic training will certainly be a piece of it. I've been up to TAC Trade Group PAC, and I've been to TAC Trade Group land. And we're going to work those details. But you saw the simulated piece of the ARP, so I'm going to have to leverage off organizations to help us do those reps and sets. Things in a program that we're delivering, SEAT, are gonna help us do some things off board the ship and, and connect, connect, connect it in a, in a fashion we don't know before. NIFC is gonna drive us to a classified environment that I talked about at Fallon, but I think eventually we'll, we'll crack that nut and get distributed and be able to do that uh, more formally. But the, the thing about simulation that I love, that I experienced at this war game is, it would be very expensive to recreate an actual threat at the numbers we want to train to. So we have to do simulated and live. We have to do both. So, so I can go out and conduct a NIFCA engagement mechanically, which I should do. But I should also go out and do it in a synthetic environment with a multi-axis threat, which forces me to re react, position, and be dynamic. So I got to do both. It's not just one or the other. Uh, TAC trade group PAC and, and was very happy when I said, I think we need to do warfare commander training. They were like, yes, absolutely. Thanks for your question. Thank you, sir. Anyone else? Wow, I can't believe this is that late. Oh, of course, Admiral Daly. Admiral Daly used to call me up when I was CEO of Russell. He said, how is my ship, Captain? <laughs> sir. Jim, a uh, terrific brief, and I just have a question about Knowing that you're going to do the doctrine work, and I agree with you, it's required, do you envision at any point getting to a document, maybe classified, maybe unclassified, that's a how we fight as surface warfare officers type document, or something that would at least be a template, uh, maybe not that unlike the old second fleet fighting instructions? Sure. Do you envision that in the mix here? Yeah, I, I would like to tell you I have that vision right now. I'm kind of at the collecting bricks to build the foundation piece and understanding what we have. I, I believe some of our foundation should be thrown out because it's out of date and we just need to recycle, you know, done. But m much of it is relevant and it just needs to be made current. And then we need to take it to that next level. You know, NMOC has produced a Sea Combat Commander's kind of how do you do this level? And I think that certainly has a place in our organization, but we need to build it back in a hierarchy in a known format so we can follow it. You know, we, we, we tend to proliferate doctrine instead of updating the doctrine we have. 
So I want to get back in that model and train in a disciplined fashion. Not don't do as I did, but do as I say, and understand what it is. You know, um, Mike Duan for his uh, project at uh, Namsi uh, did a did a search on a on a seeker, and I'll leave it at that. And he got 2,000 hits back on the Cipernet. N none of them was in the appropriate doctrine pub that we wanted to be in. So we got to fix that. That's what I'm talking about. But I certainly think we should do that. And Admiral Montgomery has done yeoman's work when he was CTF 70, putting out a lot of probing doctrine to get us to think about it. And as soon as I got on the job, I mean, I don't think I'd have been in the job for two days where he's on the phone with me. And if you ever talk with Admiral Montgomery, it's a very dynamic, energized conversation. And he does a lot of transmit, not a lot of receive. And he told me about the stuff that he's doing. He sent it to me and said, Kilby, you need to take this and make sure it keeps goes the last tactical mile, which is what we're doing. So we want to add that assessment piece of that, too, to make sure it's really good and that, that kind of granularity to feel good about it, too. Sir, anyone else? Admiral Ron Peterman, uh, yes, sir. former CO of Swedge yes, and, sir. And, uh, and former uh, NDC, NWDC, uh, you know, uh, head of concepts. And uh, it seems like there's a lot of roles and missions that are, you know, going to be kind of uh, what NWDC does now, what TAC Traeger Lant, who works for, you know, NETSI and, and TAC Traeger PAC. And, uh, you know, it's, uh, it, there's a lot of, you know, you know, a lot of buttons to push and a lot of connect, connections to be made. And, and I guess one of the problems that I had at Swedge and the problems we had at NDC was, uh, was empowerment from, you know, the four-star level. Uh, you know, when NDC used to be empowered by the, the CNO, who had a direct interest in concept, doctrines, and tactics. And right. uh, I'm just wondering, is your empowerment coming from Admiral Rowden, or is it coming from well, where? Well, it's, it's certainly coming from Admiral Rowden, I'll give you that. I mean, there's no... But is that, no is that, that going to be good enough? But I, uh, I think the four stars are completely behind this, and I don't pretend to speak for them ever. But I did brief Admiral Davidson, and he received the brief favorably. <laughs> so I think he is absolutely behind this. And it's a process to get to where we need to be. We have the most to gain at surface warfare. We have the most to gain. So I am committed to it. And the, and the exciting part about this, sir, is we don't just take the doctrine that you so ably created when you were at Swedge, we ensure that it's connected to our organizations that train to it Absolutely. and make sure they're not just, hey, we got a lesson plan here, let's, let's just recycle it. No, it's up to date and dynamic. So that's what's exciting about it to me is we, we're not broken. We just need to reorganize and repurpose and refocus and connect in a different way to make us more efficient, I think, or I hate to use that word, more effective. Well, I was excited to see your brief because, you know, we tried to train the trainer and, and you saw what happened. We yes, just established Swedge, so. Well, I wish you had been on Anzio with me because yes. you would have gotten excited by what you saw. It was awesome. Mark. Yes, Admiral, awesome brief. Um, one question that kept going through my mind, you introduced all these wonderful young WTIs, and you're going to have more of them here you, soon. You could have been one of them if you hadn't I, gone to ED. Had, had I not gone ED, <laughs> that's right. But, but the, and the, well, I thought about this is the same problem, or not the same problem, this is the same, it's the human capital part that, that's a challenge in any community yeah. when you're balancing. You're going to have all these great young WTIs balancing that you're going to want to keep using them tour after tour. You're going to build their competence till they become master tacticians and then, and then inject them in the right place. But all of them need JPME. They all need a yeah. joint tour. They all ideally, if they're going to progress, need a tour on the OpNav staff or another MAGCOM or some. Do you have down the nuts and bolts that when you find these, these young officers, these men and women, and you get them trained up, that you can keep them where you need them and give them a path where their career stays at least as viable, if not more, than their peers as they progress? So, so I don't think I have this answer done. But the proof in the pudding will be the officers I asked to stand up and introduce. Uh, I am working aggressively with Captain Black and other organizations on how we meet the milestones and make sure they're consistent and we do all the things they want to do, including graduate ed. You know, I talked to Craig Turley about a hybrid program at MPS and how we ensure that happens. Or maybe there's more college seats that are reserved for them. I don't know the answer, but we're going to make sure they're valued and we take care of them. Whether they stay or not, we'll see. 
I think, judging from the people I've talked to, they feel valued and proud of what they're doing, which ultimately makes us stay not necessarily the bonus or the paycheck. So uh, it'll be interesting to see how this pans out. But I, but I think um, it's not a separate career path. It's not a specialized tour. It's another avenue to become a SWO. And I think they will become more effective at every single tour they do after, as I tried to describe. I I'll tell you, when you go to Fallon, there's a bunch of people, there's a bunch of aviators that never will command a squadron, but are doing significant work and feel valued in the tactics world, because that's where they live and that's what they like to do. So we're going to figure that out. But I think for us to take that young officer and say, hey, you know what, FCO? There's something to you. I think you ought to apply for this program. And then to get an endorsement from the commanding officer and then selected by me, there's a process there. And there's attrition at these schools. Not everyone graduates. You have to get through the program and meet the standard. So when I go to a war room, I say, I don't want you to do this because you think you should or because you want to go to command. I want you to do this because you're excited about it. I want the best athlete. And that's who I'm going to pick. And that's who I'm going to send to those ships. And that's what I saw on Anzio because they were excited about what they're doing and felt valued. So I think it's awesome. Well, awesome question. Thank I mean, you, devils are in the details, and we are going to work it hard. Sydney, I wish I had your hair. <laughs> it, it did get cut this year, I promise. Uh, Mine got cut last year. <laughs> but, I mean, as an inveterate civilian with long, fluffy hair, uh, you know, what is sort of the bottom line, the thing, the essence that you're trying to infuse into Navy training, both that the W2TIs get and then that they pass on, that's not there now? In terms of the, of the rigor or of what W2I is not being distracted by, you know, supernumerary so, duties? Kill the opinion. Um, we have never built tactical excellence purposefully and by design. It's happened. We do it well. We've got innovative SWOs, and they're good war fighters. We're talking about investing in that and building it and valuing it. This is a culture change. It's not forced programs strapped together to meet an end. It's a culture change. We have to commit to do this. We have to commit to be interested in war fighting. I wrote an article the, uh, a couple of years ago about spy readiness. And at the end of it, I said, you know, I spent a lot of time walking around the ship, worrying about the crew, worrying about readiness, worrying about this. I wish, in retrospect, I had spent more time worrying about tactical stuff, carving out some time to worry about tactical stuff. So it's about standards and enforcing those standards. It's about a culture where we value that and we talk about it and we do it. Say and do. Two different things. We can put war fighting first on the slide, but if we don't do it, it's not going to happen. It's a culture. It's not just programs. We kind of latch on to that. It's about changing the way we think. And our JOs crave that. Sir. Uh, Admiral Ted Hans, uh, I got a really easy one. Mm. LDOs as WTIs or just line officers? No, LDOs, uh, but not at huge numbers. Uh, because we want to get that, I want to get play off that for a long time. So I've talked to Captain Black, we've brokered a deal, because certainly there are LDOs that have augmented us for a long time that have special skill sets that we ought to use, and they could become master trainers as well. So we've, we've worked on that. Frequently I get asked a question on ships about enlisted. I haven't cracked that nut yet. 
But LDOs, yeah, we're going to work through that. Now, some, got to pick the right ones here. It's all about picking the right people. So if I pick a kind of a stowe who's a technical guy but not a tactical guy, that's not what I want. And I don't want to send him there to be, become tactical. I want him to be tactically inclined already, and I want to build on that inclination through schooling to create that expertise. So, yes. Anybody else? Hey, Matt Sharp. Admiral, Sir. After, after your brief, my question is, how can I be a divo again? <laughs> this is, we all ask that question. <laughs> this is great stuff. When you said a minute ago that you, you wish, while in command, you had spent more time focused on the war fight, I think we, many of us, probably most of us, share that experience and probably spent the time where we did because our bosses were asking us about subjects other than the war fight. And our department heads were probably answering questions from their staffs about things other than the war fight. So part of this culture change has to involve what the bosses ask about on a daily business. Any thoughts about how to make that happen? Well, it comes from us, certainly, pushing down. I think they'll, if we look at this honestly, the aviation community had trouble because when they put in these WTIs in the mid-90s, there was some pushback. Like, hey, who's this lieutenant telling me what to do? Like, a transition had to happen where they valued that and looked at that person as an augmentee to help them fight their ship. And that will happen over time. It happened with us in Aegis. You know, first, um, first maybe a few folks weren't that comfortable at a console because they hadn't done it. And now it's part of our culture. So we simply have to do that. But emphasis, emphasis, and I want to go up and talk to commanding officers at SWAS and say, you need to dial in your thinking this way because the war game I fought, that was not where we've been. It's where we're going. So we must change the way we think. And that comes by valuing and emphasis and talking and and being willing to put on our big boy pants at a brief and say, I screwed this up. And that ain't in our DNA. And we got to make it part of our DNA and make people comfortable doing that. Thanks. Sir. Anyone else? Hey, thank you, sir. Chuck. Yes, sir. Um, thank you. It was really well done, and, and I really applaud where, where we're going. Um, just a couple of comments, because I'm, I'm going to write some for you, but, but uh, you know, the integration of our communities, you know, in the Air Force, there's TAC Air and everybody else that supports TAC right. Air. And in our, in our Navy, it's, there's, there's no less than three varsity communities and with cultural differences, you know, and, and uh, that air integration, you know, and, and the cruiser's not on the carrier, you know, and the staff's not there. Typically, we send over non-department head over to be the, the LNO, um, you know, getting CAG and his staff, you know, the, the, to, to really understand this. And I, I think that's going to come with time. Sounds like what you're doing out of NSOC is, is golden. Um, but, uh, you know, everything from the Fez and tanker management and that hard stuff, yeah. you know. And, and cruisers used to have a, a permanent uh, E2 NFO in the wardroom. You know, and that was an integrator and uh, that kind of stuff. But, but it's sort of a strategic communication challenge to the other communities, uh, specifically air. And, and, uh, and I've talked to Chip today and heard about the progress that you guys are doing in Dahlgren with tanker management, reading in an air plan. So that's, that's I mean, that's awesome. Um, at NSOC, you know, right now it's usually a, Sort of a second tour division officer, SWO. Right. You know, maybe a maybe a post command SWO. There's one there. We just sent him there. Okay. He reported so, last week. Good. He's a top good. shelf guy, and I told Satan Khan he's a top shelf guy. So. Um, the chaos. You know what's going on in the chaos. Um, you know the Navy doesn't even send enough aviators there. You know, and 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 we got a belly up to the bar on on that kind of stuff. But, but hey, th a thumbs up. Well done. I, I will. I, I didn't hear a question there, but I heard a lot of thoughts. <laughs> right. And I want to address one of them. And one of them is um, a, a very animated session I had with Admiral Gordy. I won't go, I'll give you two vignettes from that session. Uh, 
First was, you said, hey, Kilby, how do you know the AWC on your ship is the same as the AWC on his ship? And I said, I don't know that now. We've got PQS, but we don't have a standard, and I'm going to address that. So this is about standards. Again, I keep going back to that. The second thing he said to me is, hey, Kilby, don't, don't artificially constrain your thought here. Think big. Think big. And what should we do for a cruiser to make them the most robust air defense commander they can be? And he's not talking about just one guy. He's talking about what do they need to execute that mission. So I think, I think the door is open. And i got to go define that with the smart people and figure that out. But I don't think it's one LNO. I think it's more than that because it's complicated right. poker now. So we've right. got to figure that out. And the integration required requires us to work together at a level we're not used to. That's the deconfliction versus integration part I talked about. You know, pro words. What does that pro word mean to you? I mean, it means something to the guy with brown shoes and a flight suit. And he thinks it means something to me, should, if we integrated yeah. and trained together. Right. But in the war game, we found out it didn't. And we had a lot of wonderful friction over right. those discussions. So we got to figure that out. So I, my question is, since you've provoked me into, into, into a I don't, question. I don't, but, I'm not provoking anybody. Well, all right, all right. <laughs> the, the question is, is, is really about um, the integrated phase yeah. and ASW. Right. And mock is too stovepiped and is not integrated into the rest of COM2X. And there's some real value in the communities, air, surface, and subsurface, really being integrated in the ASW. And that is very high level Navy solving. And Absolutely. And we're thinking about those things. And, uh, and they will be worked out. And everyone's wrapping their minds around it to become, get the best solution we can for the Navy. So anyone else? Sir, Admiral Giffen. Hey, Jim. Congratulations. Uh, you, you had a fantastic cruiser tour, I think, and set the bar pretty high there. And this is a great follow on. The, uh, Statement question. Um, obviously, this was needed, and I think that you and Admiral Rod Roden and everybody's had a hand in it. It's, it's fantastic. It's what the surface navies needed, and I wish I was smart enough as a TICOM and do it 15 years ago. But it kind of says, in many ways, that the system as it was is a failure, that we weren't producing TAC Trey Group from SWAS from all the different uh, JTFXs and everything else, the level of tactics that, that certainly, certainly the surface Navy needs. And as of at least two or three years ago, the JTFXs were really not very successful, or they were just barely getting by the, whatever the bottom line is, from what I understand. So, the, so now you've got this wonderful support, and, and I'm sure it's going to stay on forever. But are you stepping on a lot of toes? I mean, are you getting a lot of resistance from, uh, from uh, you know, the people who are saying, you know, I'm really doing a better job than you guys are portraying this? And, uh, you know, are you also going to get some time and pipelines away from them? And, and, and uh, certainly Dahlgren, who's taught me supposedly how to fight my ship when I went up there. And, and, uh, it was very early in Aegis Cruiser World, and it was kind of, it wasn't very effective. I learned it was in draw two of the safe, but I really didn't you know, have the big picture. Thank yes, you. sir. So a lot of ground to cover there. Let me try to cover all of it. If I don't, I ask you to come back up and, and hold me accountable to it. Uh, I, I don't mean to imply that our Navy, especially our sailors or our ships, aren't working their butts off doing the mission because they are. And they have been, and they've done what we've told them to do. And I don't mean to imply that at all. So please don't take that conclusion. They're out there working hard. And Darren McPherson is a wonderful conscience for me. Whenever we start having great ideas, he's like, hold on there, Admiral. Let's remember those ships and remember what they're doing and not add to their workload. So we've got to figure out how to do this correctly in, in the synchronization. I think the connective tissue maybe didn't exist before because they existed under different organizations. And I want to try to influence that differently and connect them. So let's take the doctrine piece with the connection of the schoolhouse. I want to I want to tie that knot so it's more effective. But I don't necessarily want to, again, what I tried to say to Captain Peterman was not that the Swedge didn't do good work. They did. And I was their placement officer, and I often took angry phone calls from them when I, when I didn't man them appropriately. But I want to force 
the doctrine developers to live with the doctrine teachers so we make sure we haven't lost anything and we're not being dynamic to address these new and emerging threats. So I think you've heard it from many of our speakers, Admiral Roden and Admiral Davidson, hey, we've had 15 years or 10 years where we existed in an uncontested environment. I believe we don't exist that way anymore. So the threat is cha causing us to reevaluate and think about the way we're doing things. So that's the way I encourage us to look at it. Not that we weren't doing things right in the past, but there's an opportunity here with alignment and a willing uh, chain of command to, to do things differently. And I hope I answered your question, sir.